Okay, people at um, Beta Club, we took the test for the jungle and we did a, a lot of review. So I'm going to go through this pretty quick. It'll be about 10 minutes, maybe. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not going to be asking you questions or whatever. So here's this. We left off talking about schools. Um, if you'll remember, Mary um, had a big giant question guilting me into whether or not um, I feel guilty for sending my kids to Catholic school. And we left off talking about higher education. Um, one thing I want to talk about with higher education is the, to remind you of the Morrill Act. Um, if you remember, the Morrill Land Act was where the government took their open land that wasn't, wasn't being used, they sold it, and they used the land to fund state colleges. And there's a million of them out there that are land-grant colleges. Also something to know about higher education, at 25% of college graduates in 1900. Let's say in 1900, 25% of college graduates were women. In fact, since the 20th century began, every single decade has had increasingly more women graduate um, relative to men. And as I say, they're increasing, um, except for the 1950s, which if you read Feminine Mystique, you understand why. A um, couple other things about higher education. Um, there's a really important educator named William James. William James was a professor. Um, at Harvard for 35 years, and he wrote a bunch of stuff. Um, he was a psychologist, but most importantly, he had a brother named Henry James, who's also an author. Um, but William James wrote a book called Pragmatism. And we talked about pragmatism before when we talked about Thomas Jefferson being a pragmatist, that although he was ideological, what we might call an ideologue, uh, before he became president, that when he was president, he was pragmatic. He did things that made sense. He did things that were, um, not ideological, that they got the job done, that they um, were simple, relatively common sense, but that they were pragmatic. Um, and his pragmatism is based on the idea that um, you need to test everything. That is to say, you understand the practical consequences of what you're doing. And in understanding the practical consequences of what you're doing, then you are inherently pragmatic. And he saw this as a deeply American tradition. Um, pragmatism. And this is uh, sort of an American contribution post-Civil War to sort of intellectual thought and education. Another thing I want to talk about um, with the press um, post-Civil War is the rise of what's called yellow journalism. Um, sort of like Fox News. Um, yellow journalism was more focused on like you know, sexual scandals and murder and um, uh, like human interest stories and scandals that that uh, didn't mean much in the way of changing the world, but they got people reading. And the yellow journalists were important because they um, there was an increased readership, mostly because of the increase for education. If you recall, during the urban air, during the urbanization times when um, immigrants were coming in and calling for public education for the masses. This is leading to more people reading. Therefore, the newspapers became more important. As you may know today, the newspapers are becoming less important because of the rise of the, the interweb. So, two specifically important yellow journalists, one was named Joseph Pulitzer, who the Pulitzer Prize named after. Um, and another yellow journalist, probably the most important, was the owner of about 27 or 30 um, newspapers and magazines about magazines throughout the country named William Randolph Hearst. William Randolph Hearst at one point was the richest man in America. Um, if you've seen a movie called um, Citizen Kane, it is theoretically about him. He was a yellow journalist of first rate because he was able to mold public opinion. Now today, good journalism is supposed to inform and analyze, but allow people to make their own decisions. If you watch something like MSNBC or Fox News, they tell you what your opinions are supposed to be and it tends to mobilize people in one direction. This is kind of what yellow journalism did, kind of what Hearst did. In fact, in the next unit, in imperialism, we'll talk about how powerful Hearst was when it comes to um, getting us moving and mobilizing towards the Spanish-American War. Um, there's also press, though, that is more focused on reform and more intellectual curiosity. A big one, it's not actually around today, um, started in the post-Civil War era, like in the 1880s, yeah, 18, actually 1865, uh, right when the Civil War ended, was The Nation. 
the nation is still around today. It's intellectual sort of professors read it, pseudo intellectuals read it. Um, um, you know, Hannah Meredith would like to read it, but actually Emma would love it. But um, it is for reform mind. It's pushing uh, reform, progressive minded ideas. Um, we talked about actually we didn't talk about this, but when Mary read Looking Backward, Looking Backward read by or was written by Edward Bellamy. Bellamy was a socialist. In fact, many of these reform minded press are either socialists or very, very progressive uh, minded people when it comes to using more government in the economy. Looking backward is important because it's what talked about a utopian society. Um, a man named Henry Lloyd uh, wrote Wealth Against the Commonwealth. In a Wealth Against the Commonwealth, it's, it's calling out big business. This is in the 1890s. Um, we learned about, and several of you read a book called um, How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rees, R-I-I-S. Um, he was a Dutch immigrant, and he went and lived in tenements and wrote about them and, and the horrible poverty that came from tenements. In fact, actually, he wrote about them in a series of magazine articles. The articles were put together into the book, and it's just exposing these tenement issues, and, and it's, it's reform-minded. Um, you just got done reading The Jungle. The Jungle was written, it was a reform-minded press, right? He's a socialist. Upton Sinclair's a socialist, and he's trying to expose the evils of capitalism. A lot of these people are buying into the idea that because as a reaction to uh, monopoly and trust and um, unregulated capitalism where you have so many people who are poor, they're reacting to this um, educationally with calling for a reversal of the system, which is what his books are about. Um, in terms of literature, in terms of post-Civil War literature, um, there's a lot that is really famous. In fact, probably in Miss Ray's class, some of you are reading, or will read some of them. I think you're at Poe right now, as some of the kids said. But like Horatio Alger as a character, um, uh, the wrote, I mean, sorry, he was a writer that wrote juvenile fiction. And in all of these, they're glorifying the American idea of what's right and wrong in terms of um, patriotism and working hard. Um, like U.S. history classes were originally designed to promote patriotism. Um, Walt Whitman is probably the greatest, maybe the greatest American poet, um, and he wrote Leaves of Grass, which is probably his most famous long work. He wrote Oh Captain, My Captain, which is an ode to Abraham Lincoln after he died. Um, it's a beautiful poem. Read it actually in first block, but we didn't get a chance to, obviously, for you watching this on YouTube. Um, he was actually the first openly gay poet that we had, and if you read Leaves of Grass, then there's actually some images in there that you can sort of pick that up. Um, Emily Dickinson is another example of a post-Civil War poet. Um, and then in terms of the, the novel, you get The Realist School, which Ms. Ray obviously will teach you guys a lot about, and you'll read Huck Finn, um, probably the most important writer of The Realist School, and maybe the most important American writer um, ever, was Mark Twain. And a lot of what they're doing is, is in the post-Civil War era, um, romanticizing the pre-Civil War era. But when you read Twain, um, as a realist, it's very raw in its language, but you're drawing really important moral conclusions, um, which is what's really important about the realist school in that you are learning, you're taking away valuable lessons from um, a portrayed reality. Um, it's, it's not as fanciful uh, as Poe in the pre-Civil War literature. Um, wars, wars tend to have an effect on um, literature. Hey, hold on. I'm filming for my kids who have beta. Sweet. I